Thank you for joining us in today's program, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition, a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator at the Wignall Museum. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum, an interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. We want to take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Rancho Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. Hi, and I'm Roman Stolenrich, the assistant curator here at the Wigdahl Museum of Contemporary Art at Chafee College. Um, a few notes. Um, we are recording this session and all of our home edition sessions. So please note, we ask that you mute your audio, which is the green microphone icon at the lower left of your screen. That'll help us get a nice clean recording of the session. Um, also, if you would like to keep your privacy in terms of sharing your likeness, again, please note we are recording. So you have the option of turning your video off with the stop video camera icon, also at the lower left hand of your screen. Um, the recordings will be transcribed and captioned. Um, we'll be sharing these recordings through our website at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall. So please do visit our website for updates on our programs. And that is also, again, where we will post the recordings when we release them. Also, one other note, if you have questions, please do share them. You can use the chat function to share your questions with Andy. Um, and we'll be taking note of any of the questions that come up and then um, toward the end of the session, there will be an allotted time to have a question and answer. Thank you. Hello everyone, and I'm Andy Hadel. I'm the preparator at the museum. And um, today I'll be helping with a presentation. Here in a moment, today's presenter, um, Leonardo Santa Maria, is going to present for about a half an hour or so. And then as Roman mentioned, the remaining time will be available for question and answer. So I'll briefly introduce Leonardo Santa Maria, and then we can dive into his presentation. So Leonardo Santa Maria is a first generation Filipino American freelance illustrator. His work has been published as editorial illustrations for the New York Times disability series, cover illustrations for NPR's Invisibilia podcast, and an ad campaign for the New Yorker. He has also contributed to motion design projects with the creative studio Buck. He currently lives and works in the Los Angeles area. So welcome, Leonardo. Hello. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, so my name's Leo, and um, I'm actually about 40 minutes west. I live in Alhambra. Um, but basically, I'm going to talk about uh, my life as an illustrator and the path to get here and what it is that an illustrator does. So I'm just going to mention that um, after high school, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And so I actually spent three years in community college. And this was where I was actually able to take um, like proper art classes for the first time. And it was also where I was able to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. And basically what happened was um, for the first few years, I was just taking uh, like painting classes and figurative drawing classes just to hone my skills um, in, but I didn't really know where I was going with it. I didn't really figure it out until um, one of the figure drawing classes I was in took a field trip to an art school called Laguna College of Art and Design over in Laguna Beach. And that was when it hit me that, um, you know, you can make, you can have a career uh, in illustration or in design um, and there's like a proper pathway to get there. And so that was kind of like when the moment was unlocked for me and when I realized that this was what I wanted to do. And so what I started um, focusing on when I was in community college was finishing up my GEs, my general uh, education classes, and then um, fleshing out my portfolio to submit to different art schools. 
And so these are some of the pieces that were in my Anchor's portfolio. And what they usually look for in a lot of the art schools is uh, Anchor's portfolio requirements are um, like basic figure drawing skills so that they know that you have um, like the technical abilities down. Uh, they also want to see that you can play with some ideas and think about concepts in your work. Um, and so I submitted about like 13 to 15 images and then I ended up going to Art Center. And uh, this is the art school in Pasadena. And um, I ended up going here because out of the three art schools I applied to, this was the one that had ended up giving me the most scholarship money. And it was also like the, the most prestigious one out of the bunch. Um, so I was really surprised by that because I really wasn't expecting scholarship or didn't really know how much I sh could have expected to receive. Um, but yeah, even though like they say that the tuition is so high at some of these schools, um, it, can it can actually be a lot cheaper than you realize. So in the first few years of art school, you're basically doing more foundation work, um, or the, fir the first three semesters, I'm sorry. And so these are where you start honing in your, even more of your drawing skills and your painting skills. Um, this one was like painted from a photograph. Uh, it slowly transitions over the years to making work that is more uh, idea-based and um, really celebrating your voice. And for me, I majored in illustration, but I was also able to take classes in like, uh, photography and graphic design and fine art. And so, um, for example, this piece was done with uh, acrylic, um, used like watercolor and colored pencils. But basically, like they're not telling us how to make the images anymore. Instead, it's like they're giving this, us the homework assignments or the class assignments, and then we're applying our own methods that we figure out on our own into these assignments. So it really um, allows each student to kind of flourish with their own voice. And so now we can start talking about the illustration career. So five years later, I spent a lot of time in art school. I also spent a lot of time in community college. So basically it took eight years to get to, uh, to graduate from art school. But um, it finally happened in 2017. Uh, I started to get my first illustration assignments. And um, this one was for the New York Times Sunday Review. And it was about how first generation college students experience Thanksgiving. Um, so this, this story was about how the writer, uh, she, she and her family couldn't afford like to fly back and forth all the time from where her college was to where her home was. And so she was stuck on campus by herself. Um, and it was a very isolating experience for her while a lot of her classmates ended up going home for the holiday break. And so uh, I did this assignment in my graduating semester, which was amazing because when you're about to graduate, you're kind of like starting to worry about like, um, like where, where am I going to get work? How am I going to get assignments? Um, when are they going to start coming in? Uh, a lot of those anxieties have to creep up. So to, to, be, have it, to have been able to do like a New York Times illustration right before graduating was, um, it was thrilling because one, these assignments were super fast, and two, it was a it was a big motivating factor because then it it reminds you that you know this is all totally possible, and uh, you know like don't don't worry too much. This is it in print. So the New York Times usually prints in grayscale from Monday to Saturday, but for the Sunday Review, they print in color. And um, what I never had to think about when I was in art school was how my works would be seen when they were printed uh, or when they would be outputted. And so um, in this assignment, I really had to think about like really uh, core ideas of like, um, like value structures in my image to make sure that it would print really well or as best as it could because newsprint is really known to like smudge your colors together or bring your, make, make all the mid-tones like really dark. So um, that's like a new angle that I've had to think about since then. Um, I started doing some more illustration assignments and, and my career started to pick up. And so uh, I started doing a lot of assignments that were based around social issues. And this one was for Vice and the nonprofit, um, The Marshall Project, which is, uh, 
nonprofit journalism about incarceration and everything that surrounds it. And so this one was for an editorial piece uh, by a woman who um, talked about how her white privilege had kept her out of, um, out of prison uh, a lot more than it should. Um, and no matter how many times she was arrested or went to court, eventually um, all the people along the way, from the police officers to the judges, um, were surprised like how could she, a white woman, be in this position? Um, and so she would be freed every time. But um, she was basically acknowledging uh, her privilege in those moments and talking about the disparities with like race and how different uh, people um, are experiencing the justice system in different ways. Um, so while all that is happening, while I'm doing the online editorial illustrations, I'm also doing um, like taking on paintings, uh, painting projects and doing work for shows. And this show in particular was a pop culture themed show. It was for um, a tribute exhibition for the Haya Miyazaki, who is um, behind Studio Ghibli. And so it's essentially fan art, um, but it's a painting of Princess Mononoke um, or like in that world. The idea and the composition and everything else is original. I started to do a couple of these shows and this one is based on Spirit Away. And if you guys have seen that, you might recognize that if you look at this composition, when you look at it from bottom to top, it's basically the narrative of the plot of Spirit Away. And then I'm also using the abstract, um, abstracted like square shapes to symbolize like the different levels of the bathhouse in that movie. And then there it is, uh, framed and hanging. And then this is another drawing from one of those shows. And I wanted to put this in here just to show that um, uh, I'm, you, like, you're not really stuck in doing your images in a certain way. Like you have a lot of freedom in how you want to do your own work. Because essentially, like as a freelance illustrator or artist, you know, um, you're your own boss. So this is a piece I did for the Hollywood Reporter. And I was actually in the Philippines when I got this assignment and I was visiting family. So I didn't really bring any of my drawing materials. But what ended up happening was that the art director from the Hollywood Reporter, they reached out to me with an assignment to do this feature illustration about um, this actress from Smallville and how she was involved and a lieutenant in, like a, in a cult called NXRVM. And um, so I immediately said yes to the job because it was like the, the biggest project I had gotten so far in, in my early career. And then like, as soon as I closed my laptop, I, I realized that, oh no, I don't have any of my drawing materials with me. But what ended up happening was that because it was a feature illustration, it was um, a big enough budget that the budget itself can afford me an iPad Pro and Apple Pencil. And so what I ended up doing was I immediately like closed my laptop and then I started going out and shopping for basically an iPad and a pencil. And I would use this experience to learn how to, how to use it and you know, basically transition to using digital mediums. Um, and so it was, it was a roller coaster and kind of anxiety inducing because I didn't really know how to use it at first. But at the same time that, um, that level of unknown also like really allowed me to like learn it so much faster. You know? You'll see how it came out in print. It was like a full page illustration. And this is an illustration I did recently for the Sunday Review. And this one was about the idea of hell and why is it that we as human beings are fascinated with the idea of hell? And so um, just, that, like, uh, just that short synopsis of the article is um, like, it's huge. It's like, like, how do you even approach illustrating hell and you know, people's fascination with it? So um, what I ended up doing was like really just abstracting the idea of hell into this like um, simple circle, like this metaphorical shape and then just making it like a pit of darkness where I use brush strokes and the color of fire to represent the flames. And then, um, and then 
by having a person stare into the eye of the abyss, it's like they're, you know, they're thinking about the idea of it rather than being inside it. And if you've seen the movie Annihilation, I was actually really inspired by the climax, by like the end part of Annihilation. And then this is a, a little bit of a look into what it looks like from my end. So basically, when I do editorial illustrations, it's usually accompanying an editorial, right? Which is uh, an editorial is a, like a piece of writing. And so they'll give me the document and then I'll read through it. And this is when like, um, I'll start to highlight things that stick out. I'll highlight core ideas from the writing. And it's really when like the gears start um, turning and it starts to put things together um, and figuring out like what is the core of this editorial piece that I should make out the work about. We also see the next step which is um, some of the sketches. And so the sketches are basically, you know, instead of like telling the art director, who is the person that's commissioning the work, instead of telling them in like sentences, like what the ideas are, um, I'm describing the images by just drawing the images, by just drawing ideas and different concepts and approaches to the subject matter. And from there, they can either like select one and move forward to final, or to you know take take it to finish, or we could make edits on a certain piece to you know hone it in more um, and make it match the writing more. This was like the next step of the part of the phase, which was more edits, and we ended up going with the left one. So this is an illustration I did for TED, which is you know the speaking the public speaking company. And um, this one was about the idea of, um, <clears throat> me, about the opioid crisis and what we can do to lessen our reliance on it. And so um, to represent the opioid crisis, I used rain and I used uh, pills, um, raining pills, to represent like an overflow of, um, of, the, of the opioids to really show like how much it's being shut down in throats. And you have this person that's like, um, like examining it, right? Um, but what's interesting about how we use illustration is that by not drawing the person in or by, by keeping them pretty generalized, like I'm not, for example, I'm not drawing any uh, specific features and you can't tell that it's any specific one person. So instead, what it allows us to do is it allows us to relate to the work more, to the illustration. And so, the effect is that when we look in an illustration like this and um, the person is like anonymous or you can't see the face, it's a lot easier for us to put ourselves in their shoes and then have more uh, empathy for what it is the writing is about. This one kind of does it a little bit. Instead of like keeping them blank, um, they're just facing the opposite end from us. And so this one was about uh, um, like traveling to Mars and looking forward to moving there. And so to represent Mars, I'm trying to think about like different conceptual approaches to represent Mars without also being cliche, you know. I don't literally need to draw a red planet to show a red planet. Instead, if I just, you know, do a simple red circle, um, that might be enough to represent it. And so uh, to really show the part though where, you know, this person is looking forward to moving to Mars, um, I, I showed that by having the person kind of filling both spaces where um, they're on Earth, you know, next in the park, and then they're also in the red sphere. But within the red sphere, we don't see any of that, any of those trees. And that tells us, you know, as an illustration device, it tells us that this is like a, it's a separate space, even though the person is in both spaces. This one was for Oprah Magazine. And this one was for a book review. And the book review, or the book, was about how um, a young woman uh, living in the Bronx, um, she, her twin sister went missing. And so she had to deal with the grief of, you know, like trying to figure out where her sister went. And um, to really represent that, I was thinking, it was like, how do you represent having a twin without really showing the twin part, you know? And so I thought, um, if you just 
uh, duplicated the hands, and so there's like there's four hands. The extra pair of hands can help push that idea of grief, um, while also showing the idea of having a twin. So while these illustration projects are happening, I'm also participating in some other shows and doing personal work for. And this one was, uh, I was fortunate because um, me and my friends basically just had a show together over at Giant Robot 2, which is a small gallery over in Sawtell on the west side of LA. And um, while the, most of the previous illustrations I was showing you were all digital, um, digitally created, this one was traditionally painted. And it's you know using really, really light graphite for the hair, colored pencils for the lines, and then layering acrylic that's really watered down to build up values and color um, for the fills. So back to illustration. Um, this was a piece I did for Believer magazine, uh, which is like a literary magazine. Um, but this one was for a piece of writing that was about the idea of borders, um, whether they be literal, whether they're digital, they're physical, or they're metaphorical. Um, so uh, for this one, I wanted to show the idea of borders by you know, turning the, what we would usually consider the pathway, which is in this situation a river, and just flipping it up to form the wall that would block this family from moving through that border. Um, and then this was a film review illustration for Parasite. Um, I did this last October. And what was challenging about it was that when you do an illustration for a film review, the movie hasn't come out yet because you know the review comes out before the movie and then you read about the review and then you go see the movie. And so when I was in this illustration, um, I was like, oh man, uh, like I already knew that this movie was so good and because it, it already had received so many accolades by then. Um, and, you know, it, like spoiler alert, it went on to take uh, like so many like Oscars home. But basically when I was doing this illustration, I couldn't watch the movie. So I was basically stuck to or limited to watching trailers and reading reviews of the movie. And so the challenge was like, how do I represent this movie and make a piece of art that feels like it's of the movie without actually having seen the movie? Fortunately, this one ended up turning, uh, like it actually feels like it's from the movie. So that worked out. And then these are the sketches for it. Um, if you recognize the left one, that's the one that we ended up going for. And so the sketches don't really have to be like super fancy or um, like fully finished. It just has to really tell the idea to the art director and the editor of the magazine. This is like a glimpse into basically like my work, how my work gets communicated. Um, it's all through email and uh, I don't like I mostly work from home. And then this is another uh, film review illustration for The New Yorker. This one was for um, Terminator Dark Fate, which was the most recent Terminator movie that came out at the end of last year. And um, what was so cool about, or what I thought was so, was so cool about this uh, idea was um, using the idea of like brush strokes and painting to represent the human physical side of this Terminator being blown away, you know, um, to reveal like the, the robotic Terminator underneath. And so it's, it becomes not just about Terminator, but then it also becomes like a, an illustration that's also kind of about illustration itself or about making art itself, you know? So it's like, it does two things to me. It, like it, it does a call out or it, it, does a, it does its job of representing the movie but it also has its own conversation or dialogue with other artists. These are the sketches. And then this slide is the one that shows like uh, the brushstrokes. So what I wanted to show this for was that um, these are actually real brushstrokes that I did, uh, you know, in real life, like ink on paper, and then I scanned them in and then I edited the values and the levels and then I extracted it from the file. 
And I was able to use these in my work to, you know, have a more hand-done approach in my digital work. If you look on the right, you can see each of those layers is a brush stroke that represents a different stroke on the portrait. And so it's really like, like a, it almost turns into like using um, brush strokes to collage and form a portrait. And then this was an illustration I did also for The New Yorker. Um, this one was for a play called Medea. And uh, it was about how like the relationship of the couple, um, it was about how the relationship like starts to break down. And so because it was so much about the human, um, like, what do you call, like the human experience and like interpersonal and a little bit of psychological narratives going on, I really thought that painting it more lifelike would really represent that subject matter a lot better than a more stylized approach. And then these are the sketches for it. They ended up going for the one on the left. And then this was another one for the New Yorker. This was a feature illustration for an article about how a woman um, who was obsessed with the um, art, theater, dance form, sorry, the dance theater um, uh, form of buto, which is like a Japanese dance style or um, art style. But um, basically in this illustration, she's like mid moves dancing, but she's also losing her mind. Um, and then her dance instructor is like in the very foreground. And to, you know, to try to keep it um, feeling like it's like on a, like it's a performance because she's a dancer. I'm using lighting to suggest that instead of like drawing a stage or curtains. And this is an illustration I did for ProPublica, which is a nonprofit um, investigative journalism. And this one was about how uh, the consulting agency at McKinsey basically lied and put up a facade saying how they were um, like making this jail, which this jail in particular was Rikers in New York. But they were saying, um, they were basically like saying that they were doing a really good job and turning it around, when in reality they were making it worse. And then this is a quick look into how it all comes together digitally. I use Procreate, so you know, it allows us to, it allows me to record the process, but Basically, my work is very line heavy. And then if you really want to break it down, I use lines and then I use fills and then I use gradients to um, build up values and light and shadow. And those three things are basically how you construct one of these images anyway. And then this one is for NPR's uh, podcast, Invisibilia. If you're not familiar with this podcast, um, it is like a, like a science-based podcast and it's super interesting. And I was really excited to get this job because you know, I know so many of my friends who listen to this podcast. Um, so it's like, it's cool to make things that you know your friends are really gonna see, you know? Um, but this one, like, I, I don't even know how to describe the story. It's, the story is so complex, but to summarize it up, um, the, there was a, there's a group of people that are using AI, artificial intelligence, to try to learn how uh, different animals speak, and in particular whales. Because they have this idea that once we understand what whales are saying and how they talk, only then will it be easier for you know, the majority of the population to have more empathy for these animals. And um, why, that's so, why that is so important is because if we, were if we were to have more empathy with, let's say, whales, then to, you know, to hear them and to understand what they're saying, it would be a lot easier for people to understand the gravity that it is uh, climate change. And so it's essentially using AI 
to learn how different animals speak different languages or their own language or communicate and using that to hopefully solve climate change. And it's like such a desperate move because, you know, everything else hasn't worked yet. So it's like, what else can we do? And then this one is another illustration for NPR's Invisibilia podcast. So this, so basically I did like the whole season, the whole last season, it was about seven illustrations and six episodes. But um, this one happened to be another piece about climate change. And this, uh, it was about how um, a person was using sound to uh, record and document animals leaving each like different forests. So this person was uh, recording sound, let's say in a forest in like the eighties and it was like lush and um, they would hear so much life in their recordings and so many different animals. But then when they came back there like 30 years later and then they recorded in the same spot and then they listened to the new recording, they realized that what used to have like so much life and so many different animals um, a lot of it was missing and the sounds were like a lot more shallow and a lot more quiet. And then these are uh, just to show like how it looks on Spotify. So um, I want to show these because, you know, it's like in the beginning we saw how the New York Times piece looked in newsprint and then a lot of the um, digital editorial pieces are seen on a website and then you know now we see it on a phone so the majority of the work i do i think is um seen digitally and something a lot of things still get printed nowadays but um, i think the vast bulk of things is all digital now and this was an illustration i did for the new york times disability series this one was uh, for a piece of writing um, by a man who uh, compared, or uh, his, he basically compared his experience uh, being disabled with how his parents um, would talk about him being black in terms of it being an inconvenience in life. Um, and so, you know, to, to basically show that inconvenience, I'm not really showing it in, ter in terms of like his experience on the bicycle, um, but instead showing it as more of an external factor where other people are um, the ones that are like uh, alienating him or othering him. And for example, in this illustration, the other biker is like looking back at him, like he's like a, something to look at kind of thing. And this is another one for the um, disability series on the New York Times. And this, you might recognize, um, well, just the idea of it. Um, it is basically when COVID was starting to get really bad. I think I did this illustration in about March. But um, this one was, uh, it was a piece of writing by someone who had already been reliant on ventilators before the pandemic. And so when supplies were starting to get limited and hospitals and staff had to, you know, start to talk about um, like, who do we give ventilators to? Uh, this was basically a plea from a person asking, you know, like, I've needed ventilators before this and like, you know, uh, like, don't take it away from me. And what it really comes down to is like, how do you prioritize who lives and dies? So essentially this piece of writing is uh, like a plea for life. And so to really just like um, represent like that, that moment, uh, I'm using like photographic elements, like, uh, like the depth of field. And then I have some like dust in the air that is highlighted around the figure. to really emphasize like the quiet stillness of the moment and um, what is at stake here. And then this is a, this one is more autobiographical. This one was for the Washington Post and um, it was also about COVID. And when uh, the deaths count 
started to get really close to 100,000, they interviewed me and asked me to do a piece um, on like my own like experience with COVID. And so I took the opportunity to um, talk about like my, my partner's experience. And um, so she's Chinese and basically with COVID, there's been like a huge rise in anti-Asian or especially Chinese like racial sentiment. And in addition to that, there's also been a huge number of like, um, like immigration uh, challenges brought forth by the Trump administration. And so this illustration basically represents that. Um, and like, you know, wading through the water and trying to figure out where to go from here. Um, so usually I am illustrating for other people's writings and other people's thoughts. And so when when the table, turn, uh, when, when like, you know, the positions turn around and I'm the one doing the writing, it becomes a very different um, piece and a very different like a relationship with the art. Um, but yeah, this one actually surprised me because they said they were going to interview me, but I didn't think it was going to be like a, like a real interview. But um, so I kind of like, I was like, whoa, I didn't know anyone's asking that. But they interviewed um, a couple other illustrators too from different cities, and then we all shared our own experiences um, with COVID. So this is the last piece I'll be showing. Um, this was an ad, an advertisement for The New Yorker that I did recently. And um, originally it was going to be uh, like printed and um, for billboards and like uh, like bus stops and whatnot. But what ended up happening was that um, coronavirus happened and social distancing happened. And so the, the executives at New Yorker were like, oh, you know, we have to actually pivot this ad campaign because people aren't gonna be walking around or, or commuting as much. There's, like no one's gonna be taking the trains anymore. And so it what went from like a, like a billboard um, campaign became very largely digital because that's where people are now. And so what this illustration was about, um, well, what the project was about was the New Yorker was trying to advertise like their most uh, powerful and impactful pieces of writing from last year. And so this particular illustration was uh, um, to go alongside the article called the day the dinosaurs died, which is when the, you know, the meteor crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula. And so this is that moment when the meteor hits the planet and life is forever changed after that. And this is it in motion and uh, the advertising spot. And so I actually didn't do the motion part. The motion designers at the New Yorker were the ones that took my file and then made it move around. And that's it. That's all I have for today. Um, I realized I kind of uh, took my time with this, but um, I'm happy to stay around for q and Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Leonardo. Um, we really appreciate you sharing so much about your process. That's really cool to see um, all the iterations or some of the iterations that some of your professional work um, goes through. So thank you. Thank you. So I know Andy and I have some questions, although again, those of you who are attending, feel free to add your questions to the chat if you'd like, or raise your hand and if you would like to ask it yourself. Yeah, so Leonardo, first of all, yeah, I just want to say incredible work. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you did mention, um, well, you kind of gave us a little bit of a peek, like kind of a window view into the what goes on the, in the back behind all the the work you know with your conversations with um your clients essentially those that work at the, the magazines and, and uh, newspapers and such um mm -hmm. i was wondering if you would be able to you know for some of our students um and those that are starting out as young illustrators and artists to give us maybe a little bit of advice um and how you might navigate some of those contracts or or even getting some of the work in the in the beginning um that that's that's a good question. Actually, there's a lot of questions in there. Um, yeah, it was. It's kind of a big so, one. Yeah. Yeah. So where did we start? Okay. So the very first thing you mentioned that I think is like super important 
is that, um, you know, to be an illustrator or even to be an artist, it's so much more than just making the images. Um, because essentially you're running a business, right? And you, you're taking on work to stay afloat so you can keep doing more work and more illustrations um, so you can draw for a living. So um, basically like when I was in school, I was, uh, I was, I really, what I really liked about Art Center was that they really emphasized the idea of learning how to learn. And so um, I've taken that approach with drawing and with illustration and learning how to paint and dig do digital paintings. But I've also used that approach to also learn about um, like how do I read and interpret contracts? How do I uh, promote myself? And how do I um, like be a business and do my taxes and you know do my write-offs and whatnot? In terms of promoting uh, myself as an illustrator, um, the very beginning is the most challenging part. And it's, I, I think it's challenging for uh, a couple big reasons. I think the first reason being that, you know, one, when you first graduate, um, your income is like, there's no income yet. So you might have like a part-time job. Um, and it really takes a lot of time to get the steam and the momentum going to have the assignments coming in so that you're self-sufficient on illustration. Um, so once you start getting more work, or once you start getting enough work, every assignment you do will also be basically promoting you because other art directors, other art buyers will see those illustrations. As far as like direct promotion, I, um, I would like email people that hire illustrators directly, and I would send them samples of my work and um, share them a link to my portfolio so that they can find me in the future when a project comes along that I might be a good fit for. Thank you. So this is sort of a related question. Um, when you were showing us the Parasite uh, illustration, which is incredible, um, you showed us the, the email inviting you to take on that project. And so if I am not mistaken, that was a four day turnaround. Uh, so first, is that typical and like how, and if it is, or, or if short turn, turnarounds are typical, like how do you manage multiple projects? How do you manage your, you know, personal life and, yeah. and projects as a freelancer? Yeah. Okay, so, okay, basically I was talking about editorial illustration a lot over the presentation, right? For editorial illustration, those timelines tend to be really fast because things get written fast and then they get edited fast and then they get published like very fast. Sometimes I might finish an illustration at 3 p.m. and it, it'll be online at 5 p.m. Um, but it can get, it can be super quick. Like for example, when a New York Times uh, calls you for like a op-ed piece on a weekday, they'll call you or email you at around like let's say 8 a.m. and then they'll give you the text to read and then you'll read the text and then you'll do the sketches and then you'll send it back to them in like three hours. And then they choose one or make edits. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, but basically like you have like three hours again to take it to final. So it becomes like a, a roller coaster to like, you know, to get that work completed as fast as possible. So sometimes it's not really about making like a, like a really pristine piece. Instead, um, for the really fast projects, I think it's more important to emphasize like a strong idea that you know people can really respond to and think about. So um, may I ask a question? Um, so I was um, impressed when you uh, had to buy that iPad Pro and you closed your laptop and something you never did before. So what's your strategy for getting over that fear you know that could paralyze some people and for just going forward and getting it done um oh man that's like that yeah that's the hardest thing i think it's um well i mean the most simple way i could respond that is like i think not really helpful advice is to sometimes i just tell myself that i just need to do it and i just need to start 
but that's a that's a hard thing to tell someone because you know starting is also the hardest part so um i think but what i what i found that has started to work for me that might work for you is to um break it down into smaller bite-sized chunks instead of like for example that uh that illustration project um instead of like me thinking about I have to do this big grand thing about learning how to use this new material and do it as best as possible in this in this like biggest assignment of my life at the time. Instead of thinking of it like that, if I just broke it down into more manageable chunks that um, would be easier for me to swallow, um, I can think about it instead as like, okay, you know, I'll just buy the iPad, I'll download the app, and then I'll just make some lines and I'll just start drawing circles and, and really just breaking it down step by step so it's more gradual and I'm not thinking about like the big overarching um, like you know the trying to keep it like as like stress free as possible I hope that makes sense it makes me think of what you said about art center emphasizing learning how to learn so it sounds like that prepared you for that moment Totally. And um, what, like, for what I mean by how they really emphasize that is, for example, like they would, they would give you an assignment where, you know, you were to take uh, like acrylic paints and then you were supposed to do like a, like a study from life for it. But they would teach you, like, they would emphasize learning how to learn by not really teaching you how to paint it before. And it was only after, you know, you brought the painting back the next week and then you had like the critique going on it was only then that you would hear the teacher talk about like you know how they uh would use a brush to um, make like soft edges or hard edges or mix colors together so then by by just like having to do it yourself and like face that um face that challenge head on um it's also like a moment where you're really you're really thinking about what you're doing and applying yourself in a very different way than if someone were to just tell you how to do something in a very specific, uh, you know, format or instruction. We're asking everyone this. I think it's really uh, cool to see what people are inspired by. So I'd love to know uh, what you're watching, reading, listening to, or looking at right now that is giving you life and you know, keeping you inspired in this moment. Oh, there's so much. I don't know. Um, I started watching Community, but uh, in terms of like how it actually inspires me for my work, I don't really, I can't really tell you how specifically and like, um, but I think just, you know, to, to be an illustrator or to, to be an artist, for example, um, you really have to be like a person first, like a human being and you have to like, because what you make is an extension of yourself. So all the things that you take in are also, you know, finding their way into your work somehow. Um, as for like what I'm more directly inspired by, I really like photography and photographers. And in particular, there's a photographer named Ren Hong, and um, I'm like hugely inspired by him. I'm sorry, can you repeat the name? Ren, Ren Hang, R-E-N-H-A-N-G. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, is, are, well, I you think you may have answered this, but is there an artist or artists whose work you'd like to amplify and share with us all? Um, it may be well, Red Hank. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely Red Hank. But the thing with him, um, his work is incredible. And at the peak of his career, about two years later, or, and two years ago, um, he actually committed suicide um in berlin and so it's like yeah it's hard to it's hard to say like i think his work still lives on i think his work has really affected a lot of people um but yeah i think you know if we just keep looking back at it like it'll keep moving on how has the pandemic affected your work your mental attitude coping and so forth? Um, in terms of, let's say the more immediate reaction to the pandemic, which would be like working from home. 
I've already been working remotely to begin with, so that transition didn't really change at all for me. Um, in terms of like, uh, like mentally, I think the challenging thing is like, um, and I think this is like, you know, more relatable, um, is like not being able to see people as often has been really challenging. Um, and so fortunately I have roommates and then I also have a partner. And so I have like a, like basically like three people I'm stranded on a, I'm stranded on an island with, you know. Um, but yeah, it's basically like Survivor, except there's no drama. It's like happy, fun Survivor. Boring Survivor, right? Yeah. <laughs> no one's getting voted off this island. <laughs> Uh, well, I see we're at uh, just about six o'clock, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But um, what an honor to spend time with you today, Leonardo. Thank you so much for your uh, gracious uh, presentation and sharing so much with us. We ask that you complete a quick online survey uh, that will help us evaluate our online programming and plan our future programs. And that can be found at tinyurl.com slash wignallfall20. So thank you very much. That would be very helpful. If you would like to learn more about native land acknowledgement, there are two websites on the screen that you could visit, um, usdac.us slash native land and native-land.ca. All of the recordings and your ability to go ahead and access those recordings, the captioned recordings, and also view our full schedule of programs, uh, perhaps register for any other programs. That's all at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall. Thank you very much.